many, many men. Thank you, Brother Cox, and you can be seated. You realize it's a Saturday, and I do remind you that for the Hebrew people, that is the Sabbath. So you're at church on the Sabbath day, I guess. And uh, that's a different discussion, though. Um, it's not the topic of my lesson for today. Uh, it's good to be with you. Uh, relax. If you want to get more coffee while I'm talking, uh, feel free to do so. I've asked Liberty from the fellow running the equipment back there to move around a little bit. I'll try not to fix it where he has to chase me around the room like they do at Springfield at times. But, uh, but uh, I, I feel better when I'm not locked in one place and we're looking barriers. Um, we'll try to be as interactive as we can. There will be times when I'll ask questions of you, and I will need your input. Um, there will also be uh, a couple of occasions where we'll pause, and I will uh, give you opportunity to ask me questions, um, make comments, and whatever, because you will have ideas about the practical things I'm going to talk about that I want to take home with me. Uh, I come to you to serve. I don't uh, feel like that I have uh, gained everything. don't feel that I know everything. Uh, leadership is a moving target because dealing with people is a moving target. Where uh, they, they have the same, uh, we all collectively have the same issues, but uh, how we are approaching those issues and complexities of life are greater perhaps than they've ever been. At times I give a handout, but uh, what I have uh, got to where I do is just uh, say if you would like a copy of my notes, if you will email me at Carlton Coon Senior, that's my name, sr at gmail.com. I'll be glad to send you what I'm teaching from. It's usually pretty rough draft, but you can make out kind of where I'm going and what I'm trying to accomplish with the thing. Um, I regret that uh, Norma, my wife, is not here. She would enjoy you. She would enjoy Sister Cox. And uh, I am blessed and privileged to be in your part of Chicago. I'm ready for this pandemic business to go wherever yeah. it came from. Right, yeah. right. And uh, I know God's got it, but I wish you'd tell me what he's doing. <laughs> and yes. uh, probably all of us are feeling that way. Uh, I do believe that we're in a time of revival and that harvest is going to come as a result of it. Um, but again, I'm not sure quite, uh, I, I've not totally figured out how to maneuver through all of this. And yeah, I think we collectively feel that way. Uh, next Sunday, we will go into a new building that uh, we recently purchased. But there's no sense in having a big push to try to get folks to come because yes, tend to not particularly be inclined to come right now yeah. during yeah. the coronavirus. So we'll just do, uh, we'll just have church and see what happens. Okay, I'm talking to people who are leaders in this local church, and so let's begin with this. What does that statement mean? to you, being a leader in this church. Come on, talk to you once. Okay, being an example, that's an important part of the office. Somebody else? Yeah, responsibility. Having responsibility. Others? Purpose. Okay, having a, a purpose. How do we, obviously the entire congregation is not here today. How is it that you are a leader while others are not? Because the truth of the matter is that everything that we just described in our definitions should apply to every Christian. Every Christian should have responsibility. Every Christian should be an example. Every Christian should have a purpose. Mm -hmm. So what is it beyond that? Strong. Strong. I 
I'm sorry. A strong commitment. A strong commitment. And we could probably apply that to Christianity too. Because Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So I don't know that there's any low commitment in Christianity in spite of what modern Christian teachers promote. That's that's a that's a good observation because there are certainly uh, people who are not equippers, and uh, there are people who probably uh, do not need to be equippers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, through the years, folks in Springfield have access to this via Facebook feed. And by the way, I'm sorry to our church family. I will move out of the screen at times, but you know I'm still here. Um, <laughs> Not where I'm pastoring now, but I have pastored people who I I would not have wanted any duplicates of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, there's something that's worth worth speaking about. Why would somebody choose to accept you as a leader in the particular area? that you have responsibility for. Are you talking about the saints around us or the like the same pastors? Saints around us. Okay. Yeah. Attention, okay. series for our church uh, when, but it, it was on followership and I never really thought about the topic of followership but people follow a particular leaders and followership is always a decision, it's always a choice we choose to follow or not to follow and some people who will be part of our group, whatever your responsibility is, are part of the group but they're not following they're just there. They're present. But they're not going where you're attempting to lead them to go. Why do we follow a particular person? We follow them because that we feel like they have something to offer us. We feel that we can learn something from them. They have a vision of taking this thing somewhere that it's not been. They, number four, respect us and treat us with respect. And uh, number five, we trust them. And so to be a worthy influencer, to be a worthy leader, we have to think about ourselves within the framework of that. Am I trusted? Do I treat people with respect? Do I have a vision for the next thing? And Sometimes thinking about it from the reverse angle helps us helps us with this. So I think from the outset we probably need to think a little bit about what leadership is and what leadership isn't. Uh, Oswald Sanders wrote a book many years ago uh, on Christian leadership, and in the book he defined leadership as being influence. Leadership as influence. And because I think we so often misunderstand leadership within the Christian context, I will use the word influence far more than I will use the word leadership today. Because we have this idea at times that, well, he's a leader because he's co-pastor of Calvary in Springfield, Missouri. Well, well maybe so. Or maybe not. I could simply be in that 
position. I could just be holding that title. So what does it mean when somebody says, I've been appointed as the youth leader, or I now lead the choir, or I lead our women's ministry, or I'm a leader because I'm the pastor's wife? What do any of those statements really mean? Nothing. <laughs> it does not matter if you have something to put on your pocket that says, I lead so-and-so, or if you have an office that's the biggest in the building. Leadership is influencing other people. So there are so many misunderstandings about what all of that looks like. To, to be an influencer is not being in a particular position or having a particular title. It's not an office. It's not having an advanced education. It's not having an abundance of talent. It's not even to be spectacularly productive because some of the most productive and capable people in the world are loners. And there's one reality about leadership. It involves other people. Mm -hmm. One fellow said, if you're the leader of such and such and you look over your shoulder and there's nobody behind you, you're only taking a walk. You're not leading anybody. So are we influencing somebody? It's, it's, it's a funny thing. Uh, it's hard to define and describe what leadership is, but you know when somebody has it. And pretty often, if you watch, you will know when somebody doesn't have that as well. So we need to know what it is that we're being asked to do. Peggy Parrish wrote the book right after the book of Revelation. I just wanted to make sure you were listening. Uh, Peggy Parrish made an abundance of money uh, writing books where the star of the show is a, woman, a girl by the name of Amelia Bedelia. Anybody familiar with Amelia? Yeah. 13th yeah. Apostle. No, I'm kidding. But in, in one of the stories, Amelia is employed by a family. If I remember right, it's the Anderson family. And when she arrives for the first day of work, Mrs. Anderson has this list of things that she wants Amelia to accomplish during that day. And uh, she says, now, Mr. Anderson and I have a very busy day. We're not going to be here. But here's your list, and just take care of getting these things done. Well, Amelia's bright and capable, and she doesn't pay much attention. And so Mr. and Mrs. Anderson, they leave. And... Uh, Amelia begins then to, to look at the list that she has been given. And the first thing on the list says, go in the guest bathroom and change the towels. So she goes in the guest bathroom. She looks at all the towels. She says, they really look okay to me. But she told me to change and so she goes and gets a pair of scissors. Hmm. Oh, no. And she cuts holes and circles and designs. She changes the towels. <laughs> <laughs> so having finished that task, she looks for the second one. And it says, and dust the living room. Amelia thinks to herself, hmm, these are different kind of people. But she had seen some dusting powder in the guest bathroom. So she gets the dusting powder and she goes to the living room and she proceeds to spread dust everywhere. <laughs> dusting. She looks at the list again and the third thing on it was Dress the chicken for dinner. It's in the fridge. And she thinks to herself, Dress. I wonder if they want a little boy chicken or a little girl chicken. Oh. And 
And so she gets the chicken out and she promptly puts clothes on it. Amelia Bedelia did everything she was told to do. She just didn't know what to do. And pretty often, I think that as a pastor, Brother Cox would have done much better at this than I would. But as a pastor, I gave people, change the towels, dust the living room, dress the chicken. And I didn't tell them how. And I've done that at times with leaders. And so part of what we're here today to talk about is how do we become effective influencers? And uh, a gentleman by the name of Daryl Eli, he's a, he's a researcher, he's also a college instructor, deals with education and he, he, he came up with eight different things that are necessary to produce change. And we're not gonna deal with most of them, but two of them are a particular interest for those of us who are going to be leaders. The first is there has to be a dissatisfaction with things as they are. You know, one of the keys to evangelism is finding people who are dissatisfied with life as it is. Because you can't win people who are content with life just like it is. And as leaders, are we in a position where that we simply intend to maintain the status quo? Or is there a place that we're taking this to? Now, I'm not talking about necessarily a, a major overhaul, but I, I adhere to this premise, constantly improving ministry. We're, we're not going to go from here to over there in one giant step, but if we take enough tiny incremental steps of improvement, we get there, okay? But there has to be a dissatisfaction with being here for us to ever take the first step toward improvement. The, the second thing that has to be there is that we have to have knowledge and skills that will allow us to accomplish change. We're not Amelia Bedelia where that we're just doing but instead, we know what we're doing and we know why we're doing it. So it's, it's what to do, it's how to do it, it's why we're doing it. And in many instances, the why is more important than the what we do and the how we do it. Because those two things can change. But the rationale for a particular aspect of what we do in ministry is not going to change. We have been called of God to help reconcile this world to Him on the basis of the redemption that's already provided. We have been called of Him to win the lost and disciple those who we make into converts. That will never change. But I remember an era in the Deep South where the, the church's response, and this one just Pentecostal church, there was a church of just almost any variety, where that their approach would be, we're going to have a revival, and they would have somebody drive through the community with big megaphones on the top of a car or truck, and they would be saying, revival at such and such church at such and such a time, and well, try that now. <laughs> you, you see, the why is as it has always been. But the what we do, how we do, has changed. It's, it's very different. So we have to have the knowledge. So our, our use of influence, our use of our influence is got to be based on, on there being the sense about us that we, we have knowledge and we have the skill set to gain and sustain influence and to move us from here to here. And if we don't have that skill set now, we are willing to read, study, ask questions until we assemble 
the necessary skills. Okay, does that make sense? Yes. Now, uh, if we look back to Amelia Bedelia, it's important to know how to develop your leadership and how to exercise that leadership, uh, to know what leading is and to know how that role is attained. But there's a basic premise that has to be the platform that we're going to use for the conversation today, and it's this, that a position does not make you a leader. I pastor people who have no title, but they are incredibly influential. On the other hand, there are people who I have pastored who had perhaps two or three titles, but had no influence. So it's important for me to know as a pastor who the influencers are. And if you really think about it, you likely know who it is in your church. I've, I've uh, done a little thing for some, <coughs> excuse me, some years that I call midnight madness leadership training. We really didn't go, we didn't do like Kentucky and Indiana basketball and started at 1201 on the <laughs> opening night for practice, but we started about 8.30 and we went till about 12.30. So we did get midnight in. Um, it was an entry level, it is an entry level, four hour leadership training session. And one of the things that I did early in that event, I asked the people who in this church body, and I threw this open, anybody that wanted to come, and then there were people who I saw as potential future leaders that I said, I want you to be here. And I made the stretch all the way to, down to people who were pretty much in their early teens. Um, who in the, the question was, who in this church, other than a pastor or pastor's spouse, has been the most influential in your life as a Christian? The answers were interesting. It's a little red-headed lady by the name of Carla Buckley who had absolutely no position in the church. But it was Carla who was stopping by to ask them how they were doing. She was the one speaking and she was the one inquiring of them. She was the one who would be standing beside them praying when they went to the altar. And so Carla Buckley and, and I did this I did this event annually for, for several years, and we'll do it again. Um, she's shy. She's reserved. But repeatedly, she won that particular survey question. Position is not in. need to know that because you have to work to have influence. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The Bible's full of examples of leaders. You have Moses and Joshua or Samuel, David, uh, Peter, Paul. Leadership example of Jesus. But there's a Bible leader who stands out to me uh, because he he, he influenced something to happen that others have been working to accomplish for decades. And it's a gentleman by the name of Nehemiah. As a leader, Nehemiah led the people of Israel to accomplish in 52 days what they had been trying to accomplish for 70 years. That's pretty good leadership right there. And you can look at how Nehemiah accomplished these things. You can look at how he did it. And, and there's so much about it that's, that's very practical. How was it that Nehemiah, who came to this community where, where in most ways he would have been a stranger to them. To my knowledge, he had never lived in Jerusalem. He would have spent all of his time in a distant land where he had been nothing more than a slave. 
king's cupbearer, but still a slave. And yet he comes to this community where these people do not know him. And he accomplishes a significant thing. How does he get that influence? And, and obviously there's a God factor in, involved in all this. But you, you can start in, in chapter 1. And the second verse, Hananiah, one of my brethren, came. He and certain men of Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity. And I want you to notice from the outset what Nehemiah asked first. I asked concerning the Jews. His first concern was about people. Leadership's never about a program. It's never about we're going to have a concert. It's never going to be about we're going to have the best such and such in the city. It's always going to be about people. And sometimes, unfortunately, programs run over people. And it should never be that way. People. Now, we'll talk about those who don't get on board in a little bit. But right now, we need to know where the emphasis is. The emphasis is on gaining and sustaining influence. Well, it's about people. You see, if pastor has designated you that you're the director of the children's ministry, then you already have influence with him. He trusts you to a level that he doesn't trust some other people. So who must you now gain influence with? It has to be with the teachers. It has to be with the parents. It has to be with the kids. So you're not proving anything to him. You're not proving anything to me. Instead, you have to win... How are the Jews do? You have to put the focus on the people and you have to know where they are at and what's going on with them. That's what Nehemiah's asking. What's going on with the people? Where are they at? So it begins with people. God cannot use any of us who don't have an abiding concern for and interest in people. And then he asked him concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, verse 3. The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province, the people are in great affliction and reproach. The word reproach means disgrace. They are disgraced in the community. The wall of Jerusalem also was broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Now, the condition of the people, great affliction and reproach, was affected by the practical realities of the walls and the gates. Here, here's something to think about. Influencing and producing change, which is what leadership eventually is about, is we are change agents. Is always, almost always, I should say it that way, going to involve practical realities. The affliction of the Jews and their feeling of reproach was not going to change until the issue of the gates and the walls were addressed. Now, I worked with preachers for several years in something of an administrative role and pretty often I would be asked to come to a place and they would, they would uh, say, what can we do here to improve our ability to reach the lost? And if you ask, you better want to answer. <laughs> and there were times I would say, this place needs a coat of paint. And the grass needs cut regularly. And those two cars that are parked out back, haul that junk off. Because you're not going to change the mindset around here by preaching two good sermons. You're going to have to do something that's practical. You're going to have to do something that's physical. And it came to pass when I heard these words, 
Nehemiah, Nehemiah's response is interesting. He said, I sat down and I wept. And I mourned certain days. And I fasted and I prayed before the God of heaven. And the God factor is not to be ignored. Prayer and fasting for the people and the things that made their circumstances what they were. That's what Nehemiah was doing. But now let's move beyond the God factor. I want us to look at Nehemiah's attitude, his interest, and his behavior. Because Nehemiah is an exceptional study of developing and sustaining influence. So he's interested in the situation. By the way, before I move past that, do you pray, actually pray about the matters that you are responsible to influence? Really pray with weeping and fasting. Here are the five things that Nehemiah did. We'll talk about them a bit more uh, at length. The first thing that Nehemiah did was he solved the problem of broken and ruined walls and he gave that problem a practical workable solution. Okay? The second thing that Nehemiah did that is so important for you as a leader is he took a personal interest in the people who lived in Jerusalem. Go back sometime and just scan through the book of Nehemiah and look at the dozens of personal names that are mentioned in this first person memoir about the rebuilding of Jerusalem. He knew these people. He came to know them and he knew what was important to them. That's number two. Number three is Nehemiah added value to other people's life. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 13 and 14. You see the distress we're in. Let us feel that we be no more reproach. Okay? He's saying, let's do this. And they're saying, we've been trying. And then Nehemiah says, Then I told them the king's word that he had spoken unto me. What was the king's word? You can get timbers from such and such. I'll give you letters. You can get help from such and such. I'll get some assistance in for you. He brought a value to their difficulty that they did not have before. He added value to the situation. Fourth, Nehemiah did not spend time trying to influence people who were beyond his ability to influence. A couple of people in the mix here called Sam Ballad and Tobiah. And they were active opponents of Nehemiah. Now, in many instances, we don't deal with opposition. We deal with lethargy. People just don't give a real. What do you do with people that just don't give a real? You move on. And hope they eventually catch up. And there's a good service where there's a move of God. And they realize, I'm getting left behind in this. You can't let the direction of ministry be determined by people sitting at the back of the bus. Okay? So you don't try and don't invest. Nehemiah didn't invest a bit of energy trying to convince Sam Ballot to buy to get on the team. And the fifth thing is vision living and vision casting. Nehemiah told them in Nehemiah 2.18, let us rise up and build. Nehemiah had a vision. Boy, the people were gung-ho. We got letters. We're going to build. But it's not just but a little bit before there's ridicule and there's discouragement and there's threats. And life's reality begins to weigh in on the people. And they slow down and not much is going on. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 14, 26 days after they have started their work, Nehemiah has a little convention. And he begins it with this statement. Remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. And what he does is he restates the vision. Now, if you work with people, and you said, you know, the first of the year I told them what we were going to do this year. And we were going to get this done and this done and this is my vision. And they were so excited about it. Most 
most of us think they heard it, they got it, it was written on their heart and in their mind, and they wake up thinking about it every day. They don't. And as a matter of fact, if you ask them 30 days later what the vision is, they cannot recite it to you. Good leaders realize that the vision has to be repeated at least once a month for people to recall it. You have to pound it and pound it and pound it. Otherwise, things begin to scatter. Focus is lost. Remember the Lord. And it wasn't just remember the Lord, but Nehemiah at that particular juncture made an adjustment in strategy. So there's two things in, in this particular point. You have to repeat the vision to the point of redundancy. Repetition is the mother of learning. How many of you, you looked at the multiplication tables one time and then somebody handed you a test and you knew what three times eight was? Now, there may be people whose minds work that way, but mine isn't. And I resisted learning it. <laughs> to the, and, and the only way, I, and I got them locked down now, all the way up to 12 times 12. But, but the only way it ever happened was that the teacher, Mrs. Steen, said, Carlton, you will never go to recess again. Until you make 100% on the multiplication tables all the way to 9 times 9. And I liked recess. That's the only part of school I liked. <laughs> and I got serious about learning the multiplication tables. And I got them down. Repetition is the mother of learning. You've got to say it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Nehemiah had to repeat the vision. Okay, now... I've been at this with you for 40 minutes. Let's see if I can do this next one section in 10 minutes. Problem solving. Problem solving. Nehemiah gained influence through solving problem and by making the solution workable. Now, Nehemiah did not gain influence by identifying the problem. Pastor, do you have any? Have you dealt with anybody? They're no longer here. But have you ever had anybody who majored in problem identification? See, there's some people who they, they tell you what's wrong, but they don't have a clue of how to fix anything. And they go through life. That's not leadership. And I've had people who kind of live that way who come to me thinking, and they'll say, Pastor, you need to give me something to do to lead. And I'm thinking, no, never. And I say it kinder than that. We'll see if there's a ministry opportunity that comes sometime. That's the kind way. I hope that's not the same way you have said it to anybody in this room. <laughs> But that wasn't what Nehemiah did. And when I, when I was in administration, both in the secular world and then during those years of, of being a religious bureaucrat, as Brother Tenney used to call it, um, <laughs> whenever somebody would come in my office and say, we have a problem with such and such, my response to them, I learned this in the secular world, was to say to them, Yes, we have a problem. What I want you to do is I want you to go back and I want you to think about that problem. I want you to think about potential solutions. And tomorrow at this time, I want you to bring me back three potential solutions to the problem and tell me which one you think will work the best and why. You do that a few times as a boss and it's interesting. You don't get many people coming with those problems. They fix them. Because they know you're not going to take care of them. Okay? So let's think about this for just a minute. Let's think about where there are problems. And I want, I want you to think about looking at this from two different angles. 
what are the what are the problems in the various ministries that you lead? What are the problems, what are the challenges in the ministry you're responsible for? Okay. Now that's going to be very individual to ministry. It may be that we need more teachers in such and such an age group. It may be that uh, our youth center needs such and such. That will be an individual thing. Step down a step further. What are the what are the problems that are repeated issues of the people who call this apostolic church their home church? What are their issues? What are their challenges? You see, those are the things that we have to be working toward helping them with. I pastor people who, who, who wouldn't know a budget, and they are perpetually in financial trouble. How would we fix that problem? We take some of our cat stuff, and either we show it or else we adapt it and we teach it. You see what I'm saying? Years ago, we had a bunch of uh, families come in, and they were all uh, second and third marriages, and it was his kids and her kids and their kids, and, and that, man, they were fighting and fussing. And I, I did a seminar on Step Families Plus to try to help them see the reality of what Step Family Life was like. Do you see what I'm talking about? It's, it's here's the problem, but what's the solution? Because our leadership, and this is the quickest way to gain influence with other people, is to be a problem solver. Right. That's good. You have people who, if you're having a great event here, post-pandemic, <laughs> and, and the building gets full, you've got people who will run to pastor and say, well, how the chairs, well, how the chairs? We don't have a place for people to sit. Folks are still coming in. You got other people who will go get chairs. You say, well, surely you need permission to get chairs. Do you think the pastor's going to say, no, we don't want to put any more chairs out. They just got to leave. <laughs> do, do you see what I'm saying? You have to be solution oriented. And you have to recognize where the problems are. With, for the people within the church. But the second thing that we must be aware of if we're going to be effective with evangelism is this. What are the challenges and the issues of those who are out there? Out of the world. What are the things that are repeated problems? Okay, now the people we're winning now, none of them are married to the person that they're living with. I don't know, y'all may live in a holier part of the world than we do down here. So. But it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic. How do we work with this? How do we... We love each other. We've got kids together. We've got grown kids together. We just never have... Well, you see, that's, that's an issue. Uh, in, in January, when we're settled into this new place, we will be starting Sunday evening classes for anger management, for families, for uh, parenting skills, and for dealing with addiction. Because those are the constant struggles of the people that we're dealing with in our community. Okay, what are we doing? We're trying to find a solution to the problems that exist around us. Isn't that what Jesus did? They're all on the other side of the lake and they followed him around and the disciples say, let's send them all home. There's no McDonald's clothes. <laughs> and one man says, there's a little boy here and he's got five loaves and a couple of fish. And Jesus fixed the problem. Okay. We've got to think, and I'm afraid that even with the power of the Holy Ghost, there are too many of us who are 
living and thinking, and, and when I say us, I'm not talking about just in this room, but I'm talking about in the body of Christ. The sky is falling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. Well, if the sky is falling, we're still the only people that have the answer and the solution, and we need to act like it. And not just act like it by saying everybody needs, everybody wants the Holy Ghost. We've got to get where they're at with their addictions. We've got to get where they're at with the moral issues of their lives. We have to get where reality is if we're going to help them address the problems. So, do you, do you see what I'm trying to get us to here? Is problem identification and then problem solving. Finding a solution. Because where there is a concern, or where there's a problem, there is a viable solution. Influencers define the problem and they solve it in a way that works. Now, I had people during years of working with missionaries who would come to me with a solution to a particular problem. And it was a wonderful solution. It just cost a million dollars. That's not problem solving. Problem solving is using real capabilities and real potential. And then solving it in a way that will work. And here's how you, that's the way you gain influence. You be clear on what the problem is. And by the way, leaders, and if you're a new leader, this is extremely important that you hear. Don't go in like a bull in a china shop deciding to change everything. You need to spend about six minutes, six months, not six minutes. <laughs> Some people spend six minutes. You need to spend about six months observing. Just watch. Just pay attention. Just notice what's... And then, if there are things that need to be changed, begin the process of adaption. Now, there are, team, there are things at times that are extreme, that need a quick change, and that's, that's a different deal. But don't create a problem in order to have one to solve. Make sure you know what's there. Look for something to improve. How do we go about coming up with the right answer? Well, we, we brainstorm. We read about potential solutions. We talk with others. You know, one of the greatest challenges I've had with people who lead various ministries in our church is that they don't want to talk to other leaders in other churches who are responsible for exactly the same thing to gain ideas. Uh, the writer Tom Peters, who writes in the business world, I read his book, Thriving on Chaos, when I was uh, in secular management. He made an interesting point. It has lived with me, uh, and I have applied it. I've applied it since I've been here. I just walked around taking pictures and asking pastor questions. What's that golden bowl out there all about? <laughs> what are you doing? Peter said, every company that's going to survive into the future has to live with this adage, not invented here, but stolen with pride. <laughs> so I go everywhere I can, trying to get every idea I can. Okay? So... If your ministry is kind of stuck, and I don't know what anybody's responsible for, and you just don't have an idea of what to do next, I do this at times as a pastor. Call somebody who has taken a ministry through a similar process and say, here's where we are. Do you have any suggestions? But that's going to make me look dumb. No, it's not. There is wisdom in the multitude of counsel, and that's fine. Get help. Get help. And then when you have a solution clearly in mind, Nehemiah had something up on us. He could just kind of tell them what he was going to do. But for those of us who are influencers these days, we have to do a slow sale to others who are influential. I, I have known of pastors, and this would not be Brother Cox at all, so I feel never to say this, who have stepped in the pulpit on a Sunday night or Sunday morning 
and declared a major change. We're no longer going to have church at 10 in the morning. It will be happening at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Or every man in there that loves football is thinking. <laughs> 2 in the afternoon? What are you doing? <laughs> church is at 10. <laughs> it's at 10 everywhere. <laughs> <Amen>. <laughs> So what do you mean you slow walk it? You talk to people who are influencers with this. You, you don't make statements. You do better often as an influencer, particularly in problem solving, by asking questions. What do you think about? Do you suppose we could? Do you think it would work? How would it work if we had church at 2 o'clock except during football season? <laughs> do, do you see what I'm saying? It's that slow process. It's dropping the idea in, and most new ideas immediately meet with negative responses. What do you mean, two? <laughs> but you let it percolate through people's minds. Okay, uh, this is a good time for a break, but. Uh, because I've covered a lot of stuff. Questions, comments, observations, anything on this whole deal of problem solving. And we've got four, four things yet to cover, so we'll move quicker through them. Anybody? Questions, comments? Not a comment. Yes. Right on target. Pardon? You're right on target, Walt. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> About the two o'clock, is that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the new idea concept goes both directions. So not only do you talk about it you know, amongst leaders, but you also go the other direction, talk about it with the people that's participating. Yes, very Sometimes much. Sometimes we go one way or the other. Yeah, these go both ways. And the first stops his right. deals. Right. You know, I, I, I always told our leaders both at, at headquarters and and then in our local church, don't ever surprise me. <laughs> don't ever surprise me. I don't, I don't like that kind of surprise. <laughs> uh, um, you know, you're sitting there and somebody brings something out in front of the congregation, you're thinking, oh, uh, when are we going to do that? <laughs> How are we going to afford to do that? Other questions? Go ahead. I like how you said that, you know, just asking them first, bringing it up first instead of just going in like a bull. Um, I am also the assistant director for a mental health company here in Lake, in Lake County, and we go into clients' homes, and, like, we, we have a specific, I guess, template of how we go in there. Well, I have changed that for my staff. Um, go in there with an open mind right. because they will quit services if we don't. They don't want to be bossed around. They want your opinion, but they also want to input their opinion. Yeah. People want an opportunity. Um, an elder said that people are not up on what they're not in on. Sure. So the more people you can get in on whatever you're trying to accomplish, uh, the more of them will, will say, I'm on the team for this. That's important. It's good stuff. Uh, Brother Terry Shock said uh, one time uh, that change can be instant, but transition takes time. So I found that that's helped me a lot over the years to not get frustrated when I'm just ready to run with the thing and people aren't with me yet. And, and a lot of times, a lot of times people who are not there all the time, you know, somebody comes by as a guest and they come back a year later or two years later and they think, well, wow, how'd you do this? And they don't realize that it's been this small, progressive step. They, they just kind of have a mind that we did this in a month or whatever, but it, it's seldom that way. Transition takes time. You know, as you mentioned, Nehemiah, I can't, I can't say that there's scripture for it. I get the impression that he 
wasn't standing and say, hey, you go build that wall. Hey, you go do the, hey, you go. I have a feeling that he was building part of the wall, too. Yeah, I, and I that agree. he was using, he was being an example. And I, I know that for myself. If I, if I get in there and actually help people to get in there and observe the myself right there with them, I think it's easier for me to influence them if I'm standing back and saying, well, this is what you need to do and do this. And I, I totally agree with that. I, I, uh, this building that we're moving into um, had become a jungle. Um, the church that owned it had gone way down. They closed their school. They probably had 20 people. There's 37,000 square feet and nine acres. So, I mean, there were vines, trees. It, it's just chaos. Well, we spent over a month of Saturdays just out there with saws and a couple of ladies told Pastor Butler, who was our co-pastor, and myself, oh, we hate to see you out here. And, you know, I talked about it. I said, this is the most important thing for us to do right now. Because I, I know, I, and, and our church is not remotely the size of your church, but I know what happens when I'm not there. Number one, there are a lot of people who are also not there. And then secondly, I'm not, I mean, when it comes to working with your hands, I'm, I'm not at a zero, I'm a minus. <laughs> Literally. People send me home. I tried to help this week, and I, the only two things I touched, I broke. And so the building process went backwards by several hours by my spending 30 minutes with them. But I do know that when you're cutting trees and vines and, and you've got three people, one guy's got a saw and you've got two other people pulling and you've got four standing over here watching, that you got four more than you need. <laughs> and so I, I'm the guy who goes and says, come with me, all four of you. i got something for y'all to do. And keep all hands and I think Nehemiah probably had to do some of that too. Is, uh, and, and there's no doubt that he went around investigating what was going on because he, he realized how the work had slowed down. Okay, we better take that break. Pastor, anything you want to say or comment Absolutely. about coffee, water, whatever? And I talked about this stuff for a long time. And to our viewers, we'll be back in 10 or 15 minutes.